a study, I think, that was done in the United Kingdom, it described really high prevalence of symptoms um, that dialysis patients experience, high prevalence of cramping, yeah. post-dialysis yeah. fatigue, intradilytic hypertension. Does, I'm curious whether that particular single center study matches your clinical experience. So those symptoms are very common. I think the issue is that it's the don't ask, don't tell. So if you don't ask the patient, they won't tell you. And I think they, it's a comment on everybody in the dialysis team to assure that the patients uh, are not having symptoms. I, I don't think that those symptoms should be okay, especially if you start going further in the literature and you start seeing more emergent data on there's more than meets the eye. It's just not maybe how patients may look, but how they feel, and those have certainly has consequences internally. So I think that we have to have a better way of um, checking in on the patient, just how we do the checkpoints on the actual machinery, on the dialyzer, and double checking that the patient is on the right uh, machine, on the right dialyzer. How did the patient do last treatment? You know, doing a quick, you know, now the clinics are doing pain assessments. That's sort of a mandate. We need to be doing part of that pain assessment is symptoms. But those symptoms are, are very common, and I've heard, I've heard patients describe them as sometimes chemodialysis. Um, just like if you had someone who's getting chemotherapy, if someone had symptoms, you would change the dose or you would do something different to your therapy. But if you're not engaging patients, you're not asking, they don't tell, they don't tell, you could keep doing what you're doing. And ultimately, you could see there's very dire consequences. So I think in that study, sort of shed light of, a, I think, a, a big issue. I think for a lot of nephrologists, they've sort of normalized that as being okay. And it's sort of, they get the symptoms and say, well, stop drinking water or oh, stop eating and drinking. But rather than sort of saying, well, how do we make this therapy a lot more tolerable? So. How much do you find in your practice that those symptoms that patients experience sort of qualitatively after and during dialysis sessions actually do portend those same major clinical outcomes that we're more concerned about in research? I think that there's gonna be a lack of, of good study methodologies. And oftentimes we have to rely on not only these observational studies that are sort of also have their uh, caveats, but also if you get down to the quality measures and quality of life metrics, we know that that actually has a lot of effects on their overall mortality and outcomes, nutritional status. I think it's sort of, it's sort of this sort of cloud when you start talking about these soft endpoints that it's maybe soft for the researchers and soft for those who are not taking care of the patient. But if you talk to a patient, they tell you that that's probably the most important thing is quality of life of them having symptoms, and, and there's been studies that have showed people who have symptoms, they'd rather have quality of life for X number of years and live minus years if they preserve that quality of life. You know, not, so quality trumps quantity, essentially. And so I think we've announced, I think, in the virology community that, you know, getting whatever hard clinical studies like we do in some drug studies, like we do in the cardiology field, I think that is unrealistic. It's a pie in the sky that we'll ever have sort of that hard evidence. And I think we have to sort of look at other intermediate outcomes and specifically look at quality of life metrics like working, living. Um, and, and I think those are things that I think with good methodologies that you could actually capture qualitative information and you could, I think that that is probably where we could get down to some of those um, nebulous things that a lot of uh, critics look at it and say they're li it's either live or die. But you know, I, I think there's more that we do with dialysis and living and dying. I and mean, we want to certainly want to be able to thrive and have patients feel like that dialysis is actually helping them live versus the other way around. So, Do you think that there's an incompatibility between paying attention primarily to how patients feel and also still achieving the outcomes that physicians and hospitals are being graded on? I think the hospitals realize that they have to not only a piece to their, whatever the, their outcome metrics are for a hospital, whether it's uh, readmissions for fluid overload, whether it's catheter-related infections, they have clearly have measurable metrics to try to improve quality. But I think the other part of it that also is important in the hospital is, is responsive to is patient satisfaction. I mean, those patient satisfaction surveys and, and testing is important. And I think you have patients that don't feel well, patients who don't feel they're being listened to. Those are things that really impact and it will affect the stakeholder. And again, ultrafiltration, as we know, is probably the, the leading um, reason why patients are unwell, that don't do well with the, um, with the treatments, so. 
Is the intradialytic hypotension something that you typically observe more commonly on Mondays? So I've actually been very aggressive in saying, look, we don't take off more than X. Be very explicit. Say we're not taking off more than X unless you give them an extra hour of treatment and you could bring them back tomorrow or you say, hey, let's, let's model it for the week. If they're three times a week, you know, let's not hit a home run on Monday. Let's get a couple doubles and then we'll get a couple doubles on Wednesday and then we'll catch up by Friday. There's no need to hit a grand slam on the first day and because that has consequences. It's very unstable and oftentimes we know that patients walk around with fluid all the time. You know, we have them in our clinics and they walk around with 10 kilos above their dry weight. We're not in a hurry to crush them. We don't have to crush them, but because we have them on the treatment and because we've gotten accustomed that it's okay to crush them, or at least traditionally, just to get, we want to get them like raisins. We don't want them looking like grapes. We want them like raisins, so we want to squeeze them. So we need to really untrain, train everybody. And I think that comes with your, you know, we're doing a lot of uh, QI, we're doing a lot of huddles and reviewing cases and looking at the individual patients and say, look, this can't happen. And so patients that we have been able to successfully transition into a more intensive, frequent therapy, we, the first thing they tell us, and the first thing that comes up, I think within the first treatment, it's like, this wasn't so bad. Wow, I feel, it's, and you know, call it honeymoon, call it whatever you want, but there is sort of this, you know, and you look at the parameters and say, well, we took off half that we normally take off, because you're back tomorrow. So we're going singles, we're not doing doubles anymore. We're doing single, 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 single. So these patients are getting a, a lot, a, a much gentler, if that's the term that's being used. And so I think that if you can get patients to sort of wrap around what is not working in the clinic. If you ask somebody, what is not working in the clinic? They're not gonna tell you, well, you know, my blood pressure is 180 over 100, my phosphorus is ah, 6.9, they won't tell you. What they're gonna tell you is, I hate waiting in the lobby, my driver never picks me up on time, when I get in the clinic, the guy who puts the needles in my arm it has two left hands, they always hurt me. The, when they put me on the treatment, I cramp and I hurt and I'm pain and, I, and I'm washed out. I, the only good days of the week, three days of the week is good. So if you're able to offer them a much more against the grain approach and say, well, let's do something that's a, a little bit more uh, involved, a little, bit, a little bit more responsibility, but look, this is what we're gonna get. You know, this is the outcome that we're looking for. And so I think that those are the part of the sort of the conversations that you have for patients to at least open up to it. And if you could get their family involved, because oftentimes their families aren't even part of this building, they're outside or now you drop off, the, so the mom drops, drop mom off. And, and so I think if you're able to say, well, how do we improve health, how do we improve wellness? And I think it's, it's a much easier, easier conversation the patient who is not doing well on the treatment. And so I think that that would be the linking the dots of saying, okay, ultra, high ultra filtration, hospitalizations, plus these positive pertinent symptoms on treatment. And then you say, well, how do we do it differently? Because even if I want to do four days a week, oftentimes in some of my busier clinics, they say, oh, Dr. Morphine, you know, we have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we can have them come in on a Tuesday or Thursday. And when we really want to close that gap, it'd be nice to them. And then you start talking about the gap, you know, the trying to break the two day gap, I think you end up with a lot of ammunition or a lot of um, uh, discussion points that really can get a patient to really strongly consider a, a different modality like home hemodialysis.